Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, and good afternoon to our lovely panel. I suppose just to kick us off, I wonder if you could all briefly introduce yourself and how you fit into this conversation. Sure. Thanks, Molly. Um, so my name's Chris Darby. I'm CTO and co-founder of EV Energy. Uh, EV Energy is a certified B Corp that makes charging EVs cheaper, simpler, and greener for everyone. We help EV drivers when they charge their car at home. Uh, we work with charger manufacturers to bring smart chargers to market. We work with utility companies, distribution system operators, uh, and, uh, and with generators as well. And also, we hope that what we're doing is helping the environment as well, reducing carbon emissions of charging. Hi, I'm uh, Shira Lappin from UK Power Networks. So we are the DNO for London and the Southeast. Um, I work in the innovation team. So we are looking at how we integrate low carbon technologies into the grid to make sure that everyone who wants to um, adopt EVs and heat pumps, whatever it might be, uh, is able to, and that we can make sure to, to keep them running as well as keeping all the lights on. Uh, we've been doing a number of uh, it, it, trials and projects around the uh, around these themes, looking at what the best way to sort of simulate the market in uh, EVs is. Miriam Naime, I'm a group, a group leader at the Alan Turing Institute, which is the national institute in the UK for artificial intelligence and data science. I'm also a researcher at Newcastle University, where I'm working on um, one of the Innovate UK projects focusing on vehicle to grid, where we're looking at um, cybersecurity issues, but also communication protocols for electric vehicles. And I'm Josie Wardle uh, from Innovate UK. We are the UK's innovations agency, as the name suggests, and um, we help companies to turn good ideas into commercially and operationally successful solutions. My area is everything to do with zero emission vehicle infrastructure. So I'm particularly responsible for the projects that we've got funded by OZEV and Bayes that are looking at vehicle to grid, uh, vehicle to X for the future, and also everything to do with smart EV charging. Fantastic. And um, just a quick note before we start, before I start asking questions, if anyone does have any questions, please do stick them in the app and we will do our best to get to as many of them as possible. But I suppose just to start out, how will Ofgem's announce charges to check changes to network generator pricing affect tariffs and help create flexible tariff for EV owners. Um, Chris, do you want to make a start on that? Yeah, so um, I, I guess the most interesting thing that, that Ofgem have been, have been saying recently is around smart charging, right? And um, we say, awesome, about time. Um, we think that the smart charging is the way that we should be charging from, from day one. Uh, it means that when you buy an electric vehicle from the consumer perspective, um, you're doing what you, you hope to do. You're reducing your carbon emissions. You're making sure what you're doing is low cost. You're not getting stung by massive high gas prices. And whilst the consumer doesn't face those today for the majority of, of uh, tariffs that are in the UK, that's going to get bundled into the flat rate tariffs of the future, and it will get exposed through the variable rate tariffs of the future as well. So we think it's important to drive consumer behavior in the right way is to start in the right way from day one. Um, and, and that, while our perspective at the moment is very much focused on the home, we know that that goes beyond the homes, the public charging networks as well. And if you do park in the Midlands at a supercharger at 4 p.m. on a Thursday when you're heading back home, you are going to be burning lots of coal and gas to, to, to fuel that vehicle. Um, and so we should start to probably see how that plays out into the public spaces as well in terms of, yes, maybe not at all the rapids and super rapids because people do need to charge as a distressed purchase. But if they're parking on streets, they're leaving their car there for a long time, we should make that smart charging available outside the home as well. Um, yeah, I would basically agree with all of that. I think, yeah, um, smart charging is is obviously, as if we're running the distribution network, very important to help us run that uh, more efficiently. Uh, we don't want to be, we want to reinforce where we need to, but we don't want to be reinforcing where it's not needed because ultimately we will pay for that. It goes onto our bills. So uh, we definitely take a flexibility first approach. Um, and yeah, I mean, we've been involved in a trial on that uh, recently, uh, an Innovate UK trial. Oh no, this one's not innovative. Okay, sorry, shift to separate. <laughs> Too many trials. But anyway, um, yeah, EV Energy and ourselves, we've been running a trial looking at how we can stimulate 
the consumer behavior and whether there is appetite for that smart charging because i suppose first and foremost if people don't want people have to want to do it in order for it to to work um, but we found that um, I think I'll just drop a couple of key stats and I'll let other people talk but um, for people who are charging overnight actually only 19% of the time are they actually charging so it shows the huge scope that there is for smart charging and we found uptake of around 85% for smart charging um, so yeah the, the will is there we just need to make sure that the incentives are aligned so that we can all benefit from it basically. Um, okay, so I would add to that, obviously, good news that the regulation is going to come in that all new private and workplace charge points should be smart from later on this year. So that's great in terms of the new assets that go out into the public um, arena. And, and obviously, the benefit from smart charging is that we can try and shift the time at which people choose to charge, either to make it um, at times where there's less stress on the grid, but also conversely to maybe encourage people to charge where, at times when there's lots of renewable energy available in the grid. So it's, it's both sides of that that makes smart charging so useful. And then the other thing that I would add to it is the opportunity for bi-directional charging. So using vehicle to grid and vehicle to X in the future to enable electric vehicles to store energy and put it back back into the grid in local situations where the grid is stressed and could do with that. But also there's the opportunity to use uh, electric vehicles to store energy and put it back into the home or into buildings or into workplaces, wherever the need is greatest, to reduce the pressure on the grid. And also the other side of that is it gives consumers a way to potentially make greater revenue by selling energy back to the grid. So, yep. Yeah, fantastic. And I suppose just touching on the residential customer element of all of this, how do we make sure that they're not left behind when we're rolling out smart charging? We make sure that they're really aware of the opportunity that there is for them. Um, Shira, I know you touched on 85% of people. Um, yeah. yeah, I think, yeah, you know, people are willing. One almost tangential point to that is all of this has been looked at kind of at the at home off street segment. And I think what's really important is um, in our area at least about half of people can't park um, off off street so they'll be parking on the street so how do we make sure there's already an element of it costs a bit more to do that than to do it at home um, if now everyone at home is also smart charging and, and saving money that way how do we make sure that those who are parking on street also have the opportunity to partake in flexibility markets and smart charging so that they um, can charge in the same way and at that lower cost um, and we've done some so we've looked into that and it is possible there is benefits to smart charging from on street as well as off street um, and I think it's um, it's a question of communicating the offers and the benefits um, seeing what people's motivations are some people's motivations are um, for financial benefits some are you know because they want to reduce their carbon footprint so if you can say well, this is what the generation mix looks like at different times of day that might actually incentivize people to move and I think that communication will come from uh, energy suppliers, um, people offer services like EV energy and, and places like that is the best way to communicate. Uh, and if I could just add to that, just to put some figures against um, the benefits potentially for consumers. So the vehicle to grid um, trial called Scurus that finished earlier this year run by Ovo Energy. Um, actually, um, it, it rolled out 320 bi-directional chargers for, in domestic homes right across the UK. Um, and their consumers earned 420 or saved 420 pounds on average a year on their electricity bill by using bi-directional vehicle to grid charging. So there is opportunity for consumers to make a genuine benefit out of this. And then the, the next mechanism coming is Octopus Energy's flexible tariff, where they've now got a flexible bi-directional tariff. So you can pay a certain amount depending on the time of day that you wish to charge, but also the time of day that you wish to discharge. So you can take benefit both ways in the electricity grid mix. I just think one thing to, to add, I think the, 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 the innovation side of this is really important. And I think that if we take the Octopus Agile and the bi-directional Agile approaches, there are a bunch of us who are super excited about that, probably in this room, because we're energy nerds, we're, we're finance nerds, and we want to see the benefit. Um, there's also my mum, who would like to plug her car in and go to work tomorrow. And 
that's that's the other group of customers we have to think about. We need this innovation to disrupt the market, and we need to kind of have this disruptive, hey, here's all this cool stuff we can do. And then we need to simplify it down into propositions that the average driver can yeah. understand, digest, and participate in. Um, and I think it's just really important that we, we always remember what's the job the customer wants to do. They want to get in the car, they want to drive to work, they want to come home, they've got to pick the kids up from school, whatever it is. And as long as they can do that, they actually don't care if the battery's at 100 or 50 or 20, as long as there's enough miles. Um, and then all the other benefits can be managed by their utility company, their distribution network operator, whoever it is. And as I think that the other side of this is as long as it's fair to them, then that's what's important. They don't have to be making every single um, penny on the, on the kilowatt hour, but it needs to be fair and equitable to them. Following on your point, once we have those customers wanting to do smart charging, how do we keep them? And a lot of the trials have showed three main learnings is they need to trust the system. So if they do say, I want my car to be ready tomorrow by eight, and that's the state of charge, we, we need to ensure this is what they're getting. Second, they need to have a bit of control. So if they do want to over Right, that system they need to be able to and the trials we're seeing right now the innovative trials are making that available you can override and customers part of those trials are having trust of this they don't want to leave the trial and third we need to make it easy the customer doesn't want to put the state of charge every single day we need to learn of the behavior and then make it as seamless as possible to not just have people wanting to do smart charging but keep them there keep them involved Thank you. So I suppose, how is software stepping up to enable this transition? Cool. Yeah, uh, well, I think um, uh, Miriam will add <laughs> on this as well as our, as our AI expert. Um, but from, from my perspective, it's the simplicity point is, is actually the most important thing is dealing with that data from Octopus, the data from the, the grid about the, the generation mix, not obfuscating it, but simplifying it and saying, look, this is generally a good time. This is generally a bad time. Just tell us when you need your car and we'll make sure it's ready by then. So, so what we're doing is putting an app in the hands of customers that enables them to tell us what's important to them. So who's their energy supplier? What's more important, carbon or cost? Do you have home solar? Do you want us to optimize so that all of the home solar goes into your battery? Or do you want us to, uh, it, of your car, or do you want us to optimize so that none of your solar goes out onto the grid? Because that's what some some of the people who have feed-in tariffs go. I want every single kilowatt hour because I'm getting paid for those, so I'll have them. Thank you. Um, and that's the combination of the simplicity for just tell me when you need your car ready, but then the elements of control of well, I want to optimize for no import, or I want to opt I need to override and boost, and 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 I need to to jump out of this um, smart charging for now. Um, and and we listen. Uh, to customers a lot. So we spend a lot of time talking to the average EV driver about what's important to them and really understanding under the surface of, I want my car charged, why is it? What is the important reason for that? Because that then drives the, uh, the behavioral uh, insights that we get as a secondary thing. Why has someone opted out? Well, we didn't charge it once. And it was really important for them because then they couldn't get their kids from school or, or they were late for work. Yeah, make it, uh, make it easy, make it simple, but also make it relevant. Why do I give all, almost all my location data uh, to Google because of the service I receive? And we need to ensure that they're receiving something in return. Around that concept of data and security, I wonder if you could elaborate a little bit more on the challenges of cybersecurity around rolling out these systems. Sure. Yeah. So uh, smart chargers, vehicle to grid is a connected infrastructure. Uh, the charger um, is a device that has a data connection that is sharing information but also control objects with the companies managing these chargers and um, any connected infrastructure is target to cyber attacks uh, examples of attacks and threat are for example um, uh, unauthorized information access so someone having access to my banking details uh, or even tampering so um, my charger is uh, sending the incorrect uh, in energy information of how much I use energy. Uh, or even, I would argue, uh, the worst of them all is denial of service. So the charger is not available when I need it. I wake up, my car is not charged. So these are examples of uh, cyber attacks. And to avoid these, we need to ensure that our um, charging infrastructure is secure, especially before we reach the mass ad adoption numbers. And to do that, we need to, in addition to the normal security best practices of the companies involved, we need also to ensure the security of the hardware, the software, and the communication 
of the infrastructure. Um, I'd argue uh, hardware is really the security of hardware is really important when we're dealing with public infrastructure, when a potential hacker have access to that infrastructure. So how do we make it hard to have access to it? Uh, but also you'll have the security of the software. So what is your charger running and the communication? So my energy supplier is sending me information. I want to trust that this is actually my energy supplier controlling my charger. The same, my energy supplier want to trust that this is me who's receiving this information. Looking at other sectors like healthcare, aviation, um, banking, one of a key technology used there, and we can apply to the electric vehicle charging, is something called public key infrastructure. Now, with public key infrastructure, we ensure the authentication of the entities. So I would know who am I communicating with. But equally important, we ensure the encryption of the messages. So that ensures integrity. So this is the energy transferred, but also privacy. No one would know my banking details. Uh, the technology is there. Uh, there are some issues around governance. So who would run this public key infrastructure? How do we make it scalable, not very complicated? And I would argue crucially, how do we make it fair and affordable so that a new charging manufacturer is able to adopt the PKI? Uh, there are already in the EV ecosystem uh, plug and charge where you don't need an RF RFID nor a credit card to charge. You just plug your car and charge. This is allowed by plug and charge through ISO 15118 using a PKI. But there's a lot of more work needed to be done to allow the use cases of smart charging and V2G. And I urge companies in the UK to keep an eye on this and to participate, if they're not already, uh, in activities happening in Europe, for example. Uh, you can check ALAD is doing a, a PKI project. Charen, behind the CCS also, they're doing a PKI project for PNC. And internationally, uh, the Society of Automotive Engineers as well. So, I am not aware that UK companies are part of these uh, uh, efforts, and if they're not, I are, uh, uh, one of the key points I want to make today is get involved in the PKI efforts. Thank you. Um, I wonder if anyone else wants to add anything around the PKIs and sort of bringing in the right governance structure to make sure that we're providing security as well as um, making this as available as possible to as many people in the UK as possible. Um, I mean, I would, I think Miriam has covered that very comprehensively and we think we'd all agree with uh, what she said there. She's definitely the expert on this subject. But yeah, I think having kind of a, a, a system that people trust is secure and is secure and also the, the governance means it's replicable across uh, charge points and DNOs and nationally, internationally, which means that it's you can go into different parts of, of the country and do this in different areas and it, and it all works essentially is vital um, because I think it comes back to if people don't trust the system they'll turn off from it straight away so we've seen that seen some issues with that with public charging networks where one bad news story can sort of say people like I'm not going to get an EV because you can never charge them and actually that's quite rare and you can you know so you you want to you want to get it right from the beginning um, you don't it's very easy for someone to sort of latch onto that as a bad news story as it's you're going to get hacked, it's not going to work. So getting it right from the beginning is really key to adoption, I think, actually. Um, so it's got kind of wider reaching consequences than just the cybersecurity itself. It's also about adoption in, and reaching net zero, really. With this drive for net zero and the huge potential for V2G to play into the grid, I wonder if you could expand a little on just how much of a difference smart charging and vehicle to grid could make on grid flexibility. So I think um, it's a, it's a movable feast still, but if we kind of look at some of the results from the shift trial that we've we, uh, we've just re released the recent results for, so there I think uh, smart charging reduced EV maximum demand by I think it was about seventy five percent, and at the household level that's about forty five percent. So it's a significant drop in peak demand, um, and you know that yes, it kind of leads to issues of potentially secondary peaks, but you can smooth that out. So you can really, um, it, can, it can really 
basic is very important to grid flexibility and then once you start building in potentially v to g and v to x it, it really compounds and um yeah i think you know at the very simple level one charge point is the same as adding one house you're doubling each house um potentially so it's it's vital basically Josie, I wonder if you wanted to expand a little on the work Innovate UK has done in terms of the potential of V2G. Um, so there's a the Bayes, Bayes and OZEF funded uh, UK vehicle grid programme's got seven demonstrators in it. Um, they're looking at cars, vans and buses using vehicle grid technology uh, in different parts of the UK with different DNOs involved. Uh, and looking at whether those particular vehicle use cases, so across domestic customers, fleet customers, and buses specifically, whether the availability profiles for those vehicles and whether the needs from the grid really stack up in terms of the business case and what commercial propositions could be offered to encourage people to use vehicle to grid in those different scenarios. So uh, particularly of interest is the bus to grid trial operating with go ahead buses in London. Um, it'd be really interesting to see whether a, um, a capital city's bus fleet could actually uh, cooperate and play a large part in the local energy needs of a big city, a big conurbation like London. Uh, or whether indeed the availability profile of buses maybe isn't the right thing for vehicle to grid. Um, because obviously they're very busy at peak times of day when the grid is also at its most stretched. So you can see we're, we're trying to understand, um, to, to feed future policy really, where is the sweet spot for vehicle to grid and, and, and also where might it be in years to come. And that's why the uh, why Bayes um, issued the vehicle to X consultation, which closed just uh, last week, I think. Um, to try and gather insights from industry about what's needed next and um, what the state of play is in terms of technology, interest from the market, consumers' needs, and where vehicle to X and vehicle to grid as one part of it could play in the future of securing the grid. If I could just build on the uh, on the consumer angle, one of the things, so, so we operate in the UK, but we also operate uh, in the United States, Germany, and a few other places as well. One of the things we're seeing in the US um, especially in light of what happened in Texas uh, and what happens in California every summer is, um, and, and the American spirit of living independently is vehicle to home is really seen as really important. Um, we were working with a utility in the Midwest and um, I was actually at one of the, one of their colleagues, their, their house and all their neighbors had installed these um, LPG generators because they have one set of transmission lines and it goes down once every three years and they're out for, for a day. And, uh, he said, I've got this Kona. Why can I not plug the Kona into the house? And all I need to do is run my refrigerator and my Wi-Fi for a day, and then I'm, I'm good. And we're just starting to see the vehicle manufacturers um, sort of support this stuff. And it's a real shame that we don't have a vehicle manufacturer on this panel because plug and charge, vehicle to grid, vehicle to home, all of these things are relevant to them. Um, and I think it's, it, this is actually a bit of a challenge to them is, look, <laughs> Uh, the rest of the industry is looking to you folks to make this available. Consumers want this. There's an economic argument for it. Please make it happen. Um, so I think that we would, we would all very much like to see that happen. If I could just add to that, there was a huge piece from Indra on LinkedIn yesterday about them doing exactly that demonstration. So going vehicle to grid, vehicle to home and everything in between and making it work in the UK. Um, so yeah, I, I urge you to have a look at that really interesting article. It may potentially be a question for an EV manufacturer, um, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Um, in terms of protection of the battery asset itself within the EV, how much of a concern is it still for EV manufacturers? So just before, maybe it's more of a concern for the customer because they're buying this electric vehicle. Uh, as part of the EFO Future trial, we, uh, we ran a survey uh, that uh, asked people all sorts of questions on smart charging and V2G. And one of the questions was about um, how afraid are you on the impact of your battery from V2G? And uh, while uh, we ran the service if a future, I got 46 uh, answers from the Skiers project. And these are over customers who have V2G. And uh, when I looked at the data, uh, people who have not used V2G they, uh, they answered, they strongly uh, agree that V2G will impact battery degradation. 
people who use V2G, their answer was they disagree that V2G will impact degradation. So when people tried it, showed that their um, battery is not impacted, they had confidence, one. Second, we don't have enough data in real world over five, 10 years to really know what's happening. In five, 10 years, if the car companies are actually checking impact on degradation, then we might see a change. Meanwhile, they have a warranty on. Last thing I would add, uh, just recently, a DTU in Denmark uh, published um, the results of a five-year study uh, from 24 kilowatt hour Nissan Leaf cars. So these are small batteries uh, that they were uh, used in frequency regulation. And they uh, found that V2G impacted the battery by 5%. Now we can argue if this is like, is 5% the same amount of money as what we're getting from services? I don't know. But these were 24 kilowatt hour batteries, so were smaller batteries. Key point is, from five-year trial, the impact wasn't 50% degradation, it was 5%. Can I just add one quick thing, sorry. Um, Warwick Manufacturing Group on the EV Velocity V2G project are looking in great detail at um, battery degradation. And actually, they are looking at a sweet spot they've identified where we can use V2G to actually prolong the life of batteries, to keep batteries... Um, at certain levels of charge that help to extend their life. So there's also an avenue there to be explored further. It's really interesting. Um, I suppose with the early stage of development that we're at, at this point, how can fleet businesses be reassured that smart charging and V2G are financially viable propositions for them? Um. <laughs> um, well, I suppose on that one, I would say um, we're we're still discovering so we are currently running the largest fleet ev trial in the world with Optim um, optimized prime um in partnership with others um and as part of that we're, we're in trials now so i can't report on findings yet but in in those trials we will find out whether that is the case and it sort of feeds into what josie was saying about the buses you know is there a is there a business case for the grid and is there a business case for the fleet owners that's that's to be seen um and then in terms of e2g i think that actually almost plays into what I was going to say more than it does for commercial, which is, and the battery degradation point, which is that the battery is, is an asset like any anything else. Um, so to the 5% the degradation point, you know, you use it, an asset how you use it. You may just use it to drive your car for 10 years, or maybe you use some of it to, 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 to do some V2G and you get value from that. And actually you've, you've made your calculations and that's how you want to use your assets. So I think it's, it's not necessarily that people won't accept any degradation. And that might be more the case with fleets who are managing these more as a bunch of assets, essentially, that they're trying to get a return on. So just on the on the on the commercial fleet side, I think um, uh, Chiri, you made a great point about the, the the use of an asset, and I think fleets tend to be more rational about this, right? Consumers don't apply that same lens in the same way that they might get solar panels on their roof and then they buy a battery because it's the right thing to do, even though the economics don't stack up. They do the same thing with their car; they just go, "I'll just charge it whenever," right? Um, I think with fleets, you have an advantage that you have more data on how your fleet is going to be used. You probably already have a view on where are these vehicles fueling up from my fuel card data, how many miles they're doing, when are they driving, when are they not driving. And so there's a great, I mean, we, we save a, a, an average consumer about £150 a year on their, on their energy bill by smart charging. So multiply that by all the vehicles in your fleet. <laughs> multiply it by the fact that you probably know much more about exactly when the flexibility is. Um, you can do the back of the envelope calculation to go, right, okay, I've got 100 vehicles, I can save this much money, and I'm not going to be paying for petrol anymore, happy days. Um, but you need a platform to manage that data, and I think that's the bit that's being, that's being built out. It's something that we're building out, there's other charging management platforms that are doing similar things, but we also think about that driver who's driving the vehicle for the fleet. Are they going to be charging at the depot? Are they going to be charging on the go? Or more likely, are they going to be charging at home? And it's 
in some ways, if you're if you're not such a benevolent fleet owner, you might just say, yeah, charge at home, you worry about that. Whereas if you're really thinking about this holistically, you'll be going, okay, now I need to compensate my my driver for this and, and manage the flow of um, their expenses or, or whatever it is. Um, and then when that charging is happening at home, if you're controlling that as well, you can be having a much greater impact from an ESG perspective and also from a cost perspective um, of making sure that that charging is green and cheap off peak, not putting too much strain on the grid. Um, and so on the one side, there's the economic argument of we should go electric, we should manage this charging. And on the other side, there's the, the ESG argument of we should make sure we do it in a way that is sustainable, is impacting the environment in the right way, impacting the grid in the right way as well. I was only going to add one tiny point, and that was to be quite honest, which is why Miriam didn't want to answer this question. Um, so I'll say it for her. We had much more difficulty recruiting fleets onto the vehicle to grid program than we did domestic consumers for those very reasons Chris has just so uh, well explained. Um, it is more difficult to convince uh, very commercially conscious fleet operators that vehicle to grid can be financially viable but operationally viable as well and will not put their fleet at risk and that's why I think we need to do more and more of these trials to, to get that evidence and we can share that with, with fleet operators more generally. There are opportunities to help them and to help the grid, but we need to do more, more work on this yet. Fantastic. So we have one question in, in the group, and if anyone else does have one, please stick it in or stick your hand up. Um, but I suppose just to start, Neil Swanson from the Electric Vehicle Association Scotland asks V2G, at what point will harmonics impact local networks and beyond? What is the current regulatory plan for this? Is there going to be a requirement for filtering at the point of connection at, for V2G installations? I think that's one for me, and yeah. I'm not sure how adequate my answer is going to be for that. Um, I do know it's something that we have come across um, in our Transpower project where we have um, we've developed a, a, a product, I believe, a standard to, to help with the um, with the export as well as import and in order to sort of standardize that and, and regulate the network. Um, I'm not sure actually if Josie or Miriam knows more about that from the Power loop. Was that Power Loop? Yeah. yeah. So that's in order to make sure that those charges can go in and essentially be fine on the network. And um, is there anyone in the room who's got a question that they'd like to ask to the panel? Uh, I think there's a hand up over there, Ollie. Or one over there. We've got plenty of time. Uh, hi there. Yeah, Adam Malloyd from WSP. Um, I guess my question is regarding um, vehicle to grid and how it will support the network. I, will it be on a wider basis or more local basis? Because I see two main problems. Firstly, the network reinforcement issues, if you're increasing the load on the, on the network from EVs and heat pumps, then you've got to reinforce, say, the primary substations or the local network. And the other problem is the increased generation required for the new load and because of intermittency. So do you see vehicle to grid kind of supplementing the generation and adding to the generation on the wider network or as a way of avoiding reinforcements sort of more locally? Um, I think it's it's sort of starts at the at the local level and i think that's where sort of lv monitoring becomes quite important as well and looking at the the secondary substation level to be honest to start with and then also aggregating up to primary level um and that's sort of our flexibility first approach so looking at that and seeing how v2g and smart charging can uh, defer reinforcement um and whilst keeping the network operational and, and allowing more lcts to to connect um and i think in but but at the same time you can almost consider households becoming sort of mini power plants in themselves um, with with V2G and, and V2X and um, seeing how that interacts with it, it's sort of the the logical extension of distributed generation to to a, a more micro level essentially. Just uh, to add quickly on that, um, I I would argue that we can we can minimize the need for grid, grid upgrades. I don't think we would avoid upgrading the grid. And minimizing is good because the, these are upgrades ulti ultimately paid for by the customers. You'll have networks where you won't need uh, upgrades and you'll have others where you would do. And uh, we've done a demonstrator where we looked at an urban uh, network and a rural network. And with the urban network, using an actual network, actual electric vehicle and smart meter data, we managed 60% penetration on that network, but we did not have any issues. With the rural network, that was 15%. 
So in the case of rural network, for example, that one you'd need to reinforce much more, much earlier than other urban networks, as an example. Fab, um, I think there's a question just over there. Thank you very much. Um, Keith Budden from Senex. I've actually got two quick questions. Uh, firstly, the one around vehicle to load. So the new Hyundai's and Kia's, which you can buy now, both have a vehicle to load function. So do you see that actually removing the need to actually to have a vehicle to grid unit at home and the vehicle could be connected straight to the inverter and the technology being on the vehicle, I think as you mentioned earlier. And uh, the other question is we're seeing quite a quick move to the use of electric uh, in the maritime sector, in particular small leisure craft. So it seems to me that actually we have an issue about making sure we have the right regulations and standards for charging of um, maritime vessels. I'm talking small vessels, not massive um, ships. Um, and then thinking there's a huge opportunity for vehicle to grid. These things are not used very much. They're, they're sat in harbors, they're sat in marinas, they're sat at buoys. So the opportunity for using them for vessel to grid seems to be huge for the leisure craft in the, in the maritime sector. And the UK is a world leader in manufacturing small um, leisure craft. I'll just say yes to the last point. <laughs> totally, we totally agree and would like, if at all possible, to look at uh, funding some projects in that area in the future, Keith. Okay. Yeah, I don't know if anyone wants to jump in on there. Yeah, so on, on the first one, I think from the, uh, from the customer perspective, if the inverter comes bundled with the car, essentially as is the case with the, the, the um, Hyundai and the Kias, that makes, especially for, for a vehicle to load, that's that use case I was talking about where the power goes out and you, you just need to keep your fridge going, whatever it is, for a day. Um, I think it, it's, it's about proportionality. So if, you've got, if you're thinking in the asset model, I've got this battery on wheels, I want to plug it into the grid, I want to run it every day, the inverter probably needs to be attached to the wall, it needs to be quite meaty, and, and it's probably connected via DC to the vehicle, probably. It depends if the vehicle manufacturers can do some smart stuff and reuse the same piece of hardware to go both ways, whatever it is. There's maybe a few clever things they can do there, um, but it's, it's about the proportionality of, are we doing a kilowatt, two kilowatt? Are we doing 11, 12, 13 kilowatt? Um, and I think, uh, unless someone else on the panel's got a, a strong view on that, that's sort of from the consumer side, as long as it doesn't bump my price up too much, I don't, I don't, I don't really mind. Maybe a question for you and for Keith, because you're working with hardware, you know hardware. Are these chargers have the safety measures in place to allow the islanding? So if let's say there is a brownout or blackout and your car is helping your house, you need some sort of safety that if the electricity is back on, you need to make sure your house or the chargers islanded. Do we have any product that offer this? The answer is I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> OK, thank you. Uh, we've had a couple more in on the app. Um, so Brian Carroll from ESP says, how is CCS2 coming along with V2G capabilities? <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I mean, so CCS is the set of protocols that involves also the plug. So what we want to look at is ISO 15.11.8. That's part of CCS. And what we are expecting is ISO 15.11.8-20 that will have the V2G use case. It has been delayed, but uh, what you can see on their website is we're expecting it either end of this year or early next year. In the grand scheme of things, it's okay. I mean, in five, ten years, as long as we have CCS and cars adopting CCS that allow us to do V2G, then we're okay, even if we don't have it in 2020. But the OEMs are hanging on, not issuing V2G capable cars with CCS technology until the standards are out. So we do need to get those standards out, please. And then we need to encourage the wider OEMs to bring those V2G capable vehicles to market to give our consumers choice because we lose, we lost loads and loads of domestic customers to the V2G program that would have loved to take part, but weren't driving a, a Nissan vehicle. Um, or didn't want to take a Nissan LIP vehicle, they wanted to take a different model and they weren't V2G capable. So, yes, please. 2025? And you think, <laughs> you think once, obviously, once the, the car companies implement ISO 15, 11, 820 and whatever else is needed to make sure that V2G car 
the car is VTG capable, we would expect the charging manufacturers to follow suit and implement that, right? So big companies first, like the car companies and then the smaller. Yeah. Loads of the, of the charger companies are already ready. They've got products available, but no market to bring them into. So it's definitely a chicken and egg, as with all of these things in this market have, have been. But this time, it's the vehicles that we're waiting for. And then Matt Ralph from Nottingham City Council has asked, have there been any trials of refuse collection vehicles to grid? We have a fleet of 60 RCVs, including eight electrics, each with a 300 kilowatt hour battery. And this seems like a nice opportunity. What are the types of those vehicles? So right now, the only vehicles that can do V2G are the Japanese ones because they use the CHAdeMO protocol. And the CHAdeMO protocol is the only protocol right now that allows this bidirectional power flow. Uh, what we just talked about is the alternative protocol, which is ISO 1511A-20, that would be mostly adopted by the German and American OEMs. So unless your car uh, can speak that higher communication protocol to allow the intelligence of bidirectional power flows, I'm not sure you can just do it uh, with what you have right now without any retrofit that I would think is expensive. I suppose with um, refuse collection vehicles, Similarly to buses, they have a more set timetable that you know in advance, but a larger battery as well. Do you think that lessons from, from trials like the one we're seeing with Go Ahead in London will be able to inform this in the future? Yes, we would hope so. That's part of the point of that large fleet, big battery trial to see what the availability is really like. And of course, the good thing about refuse collection vehicles is they operate in that residential area that is really suffering in terms of emissions so and at really slow speeds um, very fixed routes it's very predictable so it, yes they, they may be really good opportunities for vehicle to x but I'm not absolutely sure that anywhere in the world's doing V to G V to, I'm looking at Keith and he's shaking his head good so <laughs> I'm sorry I don't know of anywhere that's doing it yet in terms of refuse collection vehicles also, what about smart charging? That are you using this big power plant you have sitting there to like maybe shift, don't charge at peak or use, or I'm sure you can help the grid still now, even if you're not doing V2G. So maybe some of the companies around here can get in touch and use this. Fantastic. Uh, is there any more questions in the room at all? Oh, one over there. Fine. Thanks very much. Um, this, this will save me some time rather than typing the whole thing out. Uh, is there going to be a need for an intermediate, uh, intermediary market platform between DSO and TSO to reconcile service priority questions? This kind of follows on from the, are you, you know, you're looking at grid scale or, or local distribution challenges. Because for example, if a V2G car is enrolled to provide frequency containment to, as a TSO service, but a local distribution constraint has a higher value placed upon it, you know, there'll be a non-participation penalty for missing missing the slot at, you, at, at, at the transmission level. Is there going to have to be a new platform developed that speaks between the TSO and DSO services there to make sure that the customer isn't uh, penalised because of local issues? And if so, has any, any work kind of started on that between the DSOs and National Grid? Maybe I'll take a first stab at this and I'm looking at Shira. Um, so uh, we, I think, were the first to bid EV flexibility into the, uh, the DSOs um, at the residential level, I believe, in the UK, um, commercially beyond a, beyond a, a pilot. Um, and we were involved in Shift, as, as you mentioned, Shira. Um, and we regularly deal with not the TSO, DSO constraint, but the DSO householder environment retailer set of constraints or the solar panels on my roof and the DSO flexibility. So I think there are platforms out there that can deal with these constraints today. Um, and there's an element of, yes, there's a strict set of rules we should follow, but then there's heuristics as well about saying, well, you want me to make predictions about two days in advance of what the load's gonna be uh, for one scheme that I'm bidding into, and in another one, it's a half hour in advance window. And so we say, well, we'll derate that by X and we'll derate that by Y. And then between us, we aim to hit our, our sort of commitments through, through that. If you try and do it at the individual vehicle level, 
you're going to be in trouble because <laughs> someone's going to be late for something and then it all, it all kind of um, it all becomes a bit of a mess so you do need someone to aggregate it up um, and EV Energy is one of the folks who can do that aggregation there are, there are other folks in the market as well um, and I think that the answer is basically that platform has been built to some degree or another um, it's about maybe there's some tweaks to the types of constraints we have maybe there's some tweaks to the time windows we do those over yeah I would say um it doesn't, it, I don't know if it necessarily needs to be a new platform, but the communication has to be there. And you also have to think once you're getting too large volumes, uh, not making kind of manual decisions on this kind of things, but automating those decisions and having that communication uh, between the transmission and distribution level. Um, we have started work on that. Our smart grid team does a lot of work on that. We had a, a large project that's just concluded called Power Potential, looking at germs uh, between transmission and distribution. Um, so yeah, it's all, it's all evolving and how it's going to look in the future. Um, watch this space. <laughs> and thank you very much to everyone on the panel. Um, I hope everyone's enjoyed the conversation. Please join me in giving them a big round of applause. Thank you. And thank you, Molly, for hosting that panel session. Thanks very much. If you did